What is the American dream? The dream that you, irrespective of your color, gender, heritage, or status, can achieve success through hard work. It's a dream that has lit the long, dark nights of many an intrepid refugee and immigrant that has stepped on our shores. That, according to Jean-Pierre Conte, an American businessman and philanthropist. When writer James Turslow Adams first coined the phrase, the American dream, in 1931, he wrote that it was that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. Tonight, we profile a Midlander who has achieved the American dream. He came to Texas from Mexico when he was 10. He didn't speak a word of English. He spent his summers picking onions with his brother and parents to save money for a house in Odessa. He always had a job, summers and after school, college at night while working full time. Now he is a successful entrepreneur, owning with partners an oil field tool company, a golf clothing business, and a tequila manufacturing business. His is an inspiring story, and it's good to hear inspiring stories. So tonight we ask Aaron Marquez, how did you achieve the American dream? I'm Becky Ferguson, and this is One Question. Aaron Marquez moved from Mexico to West Texas when he was a little boy. He didn't speak English. His family didn't have money. From picking produce to running big business, tonight we ask Aaron Marquez, how did you achieve the American dream? Well, I want to start at the very beginning. Uh, I enjoyed reading your book and um, your early childhood in the United States. So can you just sort of narrate that? You know, what brought you here and how old you were and about your family? Growing up, my dad worked in the United States, so mom had two jobs, and it was four of us. I have an older brother and two younger sisters. So my dad was working in the U.S., so he would come back once, probably every month, sometimes a couple months before he, he would come back to, uh, to Mexico. And it was, it was becoming a problem because he was not there, and, and then mom had two jobs. So dad came and, and talked to mom, to mom, and I remember that like if it was yesterday about moving to the United States. And dad wanted us to come to the U.S. so we can spend more time together. So when we moved to the U.S., we had to work in the onion fields. So when our last day of school, we moved to uh, Fort Stockton from Mexico. And uh, we lived in a, <clears throat> in a small pop-up trailer. And we would get up in the morning at 4 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning before the sun is, uh, is out. And we'll work till 6 o'clock at night every day. And we'll do that the entire summer. And so it was me and my mom, my dad, and my brother. <clears throat> and they'll assign you um, a couple of rows of onions, and you have to keep working through until you, you don't see anything else in front of you. To that date, I still hate onions. And then, <laughs> <laughs> on the last week before school started, we moved to Odessa. And we started going to school in Odessa. How was your English? It was terrible. I, you know, I, I spoke no English. My mom spoke no English. No one in my family spoke English except my dad. So starting school was a very difficult to adjust, not speaking the language, not knowing, you know, not knowing the, the culture. I recall uh, walking into uh, the school cafeteria, and I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? You have free lunch? You know, you have, like, this is a cafeteria for students? Because in Mexico, we had a little burrito stand, and that's where everybody who had money would go and get a burrito, and then you go, you play soccer and until you go back to, uh, to class, I was enrolled in ESL classes, in English as a second language, um, which I wasn't a big fan of. One, um, we lived in South Odessa, and the only school that had ESL classes was Ross Elementary in, um, in Odessa, which is the northern side of Odessa. So I would have to take five buses to get to school in the morning and then come back. So it was a long day to do that. And when I started going to class, I wasn't a big fan of it because everyone in my class spoke 
only Spanish. Uh, the curriculum was in Spanish. The teacher only spoke to me in Spanish. So there was no way I was going to learn to speak English under those circumstances. So the next day I told mom, I said, mom, just put me in the regular classes. One, I don't have to drive the bus or get up, be on the bus so many times. Two, I said, that's the only way I'm going to learn to speak English is, and I would tell my cousins, I would tell the, for my friends that I, that I would meet, hey, only talk to me in English. Like, why, you don't speak English? I'm like, exactly. Talk to me, that, that, that's the only way I'm going to learn. You had mentioned, I believe in your book, that each summer you all would go back to Fort Stockton. Right. And do more onion picking so that you could buy a home. That's correct. So we did that, we did that two, for two summers. We had a, a temporary work uh, permit. And it was, it was given to dad whenever they were needing uh, people to pick onions in Cayonosa and Fort Stockton and, and in that area. So that's is how my dad was able to get his, his uh, work visa to be in the U.S. He then la later applied for a residentship. Then he applied for us to become residents. Well, that process took forever. I became a legal resident of the U.S. when I was 17. And my parents bought a house in Odessa uh, for $32,000, $32 or $33,000 in Odessa. And that was our first home that, that we had. It was difficult to get financing because my dad was also, you know, first generation, you know, uh, he just became a legal resident. So it was very difficult to get, get credit and, and everything. So we saved money and bought a house. And it was, it was one of the experiences that I will never forget whenever you, you become a, uh, you know, a homeowner. Did you have coaches or there other people throughout your elementary and high school years that had a big influence on you? What was um, interesting, during the first week or two weeks of school, they had junior achievement. And that was probably the coolest program that if I look back now as growing up, that was probably the coolest program for me that said, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a businessman. I'm, uh, this is, I, I love this side. They show, show you how to balance your checkbook and how to, how to make money. And I mean, it, so I was like, that program was, was changed, changed the way I, I wanted. I knew that I wanted, to be, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to do something in business. And I felt that if, if I succeeded, my parents' sacrifices that they made were, they were gonna feel comfortable, you know, with, I, want, I wanted them to be proud for the decisions that they made whenever they chose to bring, come to the U.S. And I would tell mom and dad, um, mom, I'm gonna be rich, mom. Uh, I'm gonna be wealthy and, and I'm gonna take care of y'all and we're all gonna be fine. And, and mom's like, you can do anything you want, but what you want is your health. We want, we want to be healthy and want to do this. And, I didn't, and, and then my dad's like, you don't even speak English yet. You can't, talk, you can't even talk like that. I said, that's, that's what I want. That's my mindset. I'm, I'm going to do this. So um, when you graduated from high school, um, what was your path after that? So when I, when I was 16, I was, I was working at Taco Villa and Blockbuster. And, and I worked at Sears. I was the employee of the month at Sears. I, I worked everywhere through high school. So I, my, I, I didn't get to do as many things that I, that I wanted. So when I graduated high school, um, my brother, who, who I looked up to, he graduated high school and he went to, straight to work because no one in our family had ever graduated from college. No one had. But I knew that that wasn't the path, was not going to take me to the, to, in the direction that I wanted to go. Um, so I didn't have really anyone to, to look, look for, um, but a friend of mine had got a job at, at Huntsman Polymers in Odessa and said, hey, they're hiring. And, um, they're paying $14 an hour to, to be a laborer. Uh, you, should come, you should come work. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try it. Uh, it was during the summer, uh, May of 2000 is when I graduated high school. Uh, it was in the summer, so when August came around, I enrolled at Odessa College. And uh, I went to school at night. And so during those three months, I had been promoted from a laborer to a lead man. So I had a crew of 10 guys that were twice as old as I was, older than my dad that worked for me at, at that point. And the, the, the head, the general manager said, hey, you have a, you have a, you have a good future. He was, and I was 18, he was like, you're a good kid. And, and then he will see me when school started and during, during uh, the break room, in the break room during, um, I will have my books and I will, I will be doing homework because I will have to go to class from seven to 10 o'clock at night, every Monday through Thursday. 
because I had to work during the day. And so I got, I got promoted during that time. And then as I was going to school, I got promoted again um, with, with the same company. And now I'm making more money than my dad was. Well, I'm still going to, to uh, Odessa College. And they told me, hey, if you get your degree, even, if, even though it's a two-year degree, I said, we'll get you another opportunity to do that. So I, was, I started taking 18 hours of school. And sometimes going to, uh, going to school wearing my coveralls. And if you've ever been in South Odessa, you smell like benzene. I've, a lot of times, uh, Becky, I, was at, I would be asked to sit outside the class because I smell so bad. Um, but so I did that and I got my two-year degree um, from, from, um, from Odessa College. And then I did the co-op program at University of Connecticut. And I, at that point, I had, after my two-year degree, I got a great opportunity by, with Neighbors Industries. And they paid my tuition if I went to go work with, with them. And so I, my career kind of went to Neighbors. It was, it was an incredible five years with them. Um, I never had a really a good opportunity to, uh, um, to do the whole student school um, you know, experience that, that everyone had. And, uh, but I always wanted to go back and, and get my MBA. So I went back to the University of Oklahoma and got a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma. And I was gonna start my MBA and publishing a book, launching a tequila company, doing so many other things. I, I, and then I had the interns from University of Oklahoma that, are, that we'll have again this summer. I was like, you know what? I'll just help the school more through those means. So when did you start Wildcat? Was that the first company that you started? No, the first company that I started um, was St. Andrew's Royalties. It's a, it's a mineral buying company that, that I have. I still have that now. I started that in 20, uh, 2009. So I left Neighbors after five years. Um, 2009 was such a, it was a bad year in the industry. We kept downsizing and downsizing. And honestly, initially, the only reason why I went the corporate route is because I wanted to run, I wanted to be in the political area in some capacity. Uh, and Whenever I decided that, hey, that's just not going to be for me, I just I didn't want to be part. I didn't want to be in the corporate world. I wanted to get out and, and do something more on the entrepreneur side. So in 2009, I started St. Andrews Royalties, um, and I, I I enjoyed I enjoyed um, my phone wouldn't ring as much. There was not no people interaction. Buying minerals is very very low key. Uh, and I had a friend that came and visited me, and he's like, hey, man, this is, this is great, but your, your passion is people. Your passion is leading. Your passion is motivating others. I was like, this is fun, but you're probably going to get tired of that. So in 2012, I had an opportunity to, you know, I customers that I knew from neighbors, hey, the, there was a, the increase of work activity has, um, had increased quite a bit. So they reached out to me about, you know, uh, you know, starting a company or doing something, and and uh, I didn't want to do it. I was like, you know what, I I don't want to do anything. And then a friend of mine reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to invest in in buying out buying some blowout preventers? And I had we had had a good year, and I, and we needed some uh, capital, some tax deductions. I was like, sure, uh, let's do it. And tell me how many um, offices you have or how many plants you have with Wildcat. S uh, six. We have six locations, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, New Mexico, uh, um, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, we have uh, San Antonio, we have Odessa, we have uh, McAllister, Oklahoma, and also Oklahoma City. So what made you decide to get into the clothing business? It's, uh, the clothing business, it's, it's, uh, it's fun. You know, I, I always like, you know, the, the, what we're looking, what we're going to build from, uh, on that on Blackwell is more of a performance line, but also casual and dressy. And I, there's really not a lot of lines that have everything that where we see the vision for that. And Abraham Answer, my partner in that, um, he has a lot of appeal, especially with with young golfers and, and his and his background in Mexico. He's opened up so many first tees and uh, the first tee programs in Mexico. So he he's known throughout the the country so well. And so they, have, they always wanted to wear the shirts that, that he was wearing, in which we, we made them just um, initially for fun, and, and it's become a, an incredible business. I think that retail, the reason why we decided to do that is retail has changed. It's no longer brick and mortar. It's no longer that. It's more direct-to-consumer. 
So we felt that through good marketing, through good products, if you can reach the consumer um, directly, I was like, this, this would be a great opportunity. And uh, we personally buy so many corporate gear for, for Wildcat and for Fletcher and for, for other companies. And I'm always seeking out, um, trying to buy the right, the right shirts. And um, so I wanted, I was like, why not design them ourselves and create them and, and, uh, and, and market that. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. Where can people get those? Are those marketed all over the place, or is it just through your website? Right, right now, it's just through it's a, it's a direct to consumer model through the website, um, but we ship all over the world, um, and we have stuff being made in you know in Panama, in in Korea, in Italy, all over the place. And this year, launching in 2020 has been was difficult because our supply chain was was uh, disrupted. disrupted. So we. We didn't get to launch everything that we wanted, but we're, we're definitely making up ground right now. So then you needed something to drink. For sure. That, the Fletch Azul is, uh, that was such a fun, it's such a fun project. Um, I remember speaking last year or two years ago in New York at a Simmons conference and I finished speaking and I, I was so well prepared because I was like, there's, I, don't want, I didn't want anyone to ask me a question that I wasn't going to know the answer to. So I was studying all the metrics about fracking and drilling and just everything. So I finished speaking and the first question that they asked me is like, what makes an oil and gas guy want to get in, want to get in tequila, in the tequila business? And um, I, I just told them, I said, you know what? I was like, if you've been in the oil and gas industry long enough, I said, trust me, you're going to need something good to drink. And boy, was I right. <laughs> you know? I mean, boy, was I right. It's like now, it's like 2020 alcohol sales went at an all-time high um, because, in, because of COVID. Everyone was consuming alcohol. And so Fletcher Soul started honestly just like as a, as a hobby for us. I was uh, with Abraham Answer in Mexico, and everyone, again, kept asking him what his favorite tequila is. And for us, in, in our culture, that's what we drink, is you know, it's tequila. It's, uh, so um, we started talking about it. I said, hey, I'm going to start looking into this to see what, what could be done. And we had a, a mutual friend that his family makes, uh, is the oldest tequila producer um, in, in Tequila Jalisco. Um, so we knew that we can get the right, if we got the right recipe, that we'll, we'll be able to... Um, We'll be able to um, work work with them, and so we created our. We wanted a certain profile. For us, what's important was to change the stigma of tequila. A lot of people associate tequila with worms, with with lines, or you pinch your nose, or you mix it with a margarita, and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with today's actually National Margarita Day, but um, there's nothing wrong with having you know, tequila with, with uh, a margarita, but the best tequila is consumed just straight. And that's what we wanted to, to be able to introduce that to, to North America, is something that you can sip. You know, I have friends of mine that are, are big Scotch guys, and they'll drink like the extra Añejo. Or if they're like vodka, we have what's called a Cristalino, which is a tequila that's triple filter, that's very, very smooth, that's clear. Um, so we wanted to create a profile that, that changed everyone's, you know, you know, vision of that or their recollection that they had of tequila what, that they consumed during college. So, and we, it's been, it's been great because it's very healthy. We had, there's no sugar, there's no coloring. So you can have two or three drinks in the next day. You don't, you mean, you feel perfectly fine. And that's what was so appealing to Abraham is that he could have a couple of drinks or a couple of cocktails and the next morning you're, you're feeling fine because there's no, there's no sugar in that. And so why does it have to be produced in Mexico? To be called tequila, it has to be called, it has to be produced in Tequila Jalisco in that small region. Very similar to Champagne and Champagne or, or Prosecco in, in, you know, in, in Italy. And um, so it's just to be made in, uh, to be called tequila, it has to be made in a, a small town called Tequila Jalisco, which is about 45 minutes outside of uh, Guadalajara. So that's where it's grown and that's where you manufacture it? Yes. So we, we, uh, we grow everything in our agave fields are, are there in Tequila Jalisco. And we bottle everything there and then we import into the U.S. And what markets are you in right now? So right now we're in, in Texas. We're in uh, South Carolina in Georgia. But in May, we're going to be nationwide. We'll be all over. We'll be in 46 states in the United States 
and will be all over Canada. And we're actually just finalizing some some uh, contracts where we're gonna we're gonna have uh, global distribution within the next 12 months as well. So it's uh, it's pretty exciting because it began as a uh, something small, something that we wanted to create just between us, and it's the product so good um, that it it's been. The, you know, like even in this area, you go to most of the restaurants, they have it now, and it's been very, very supportive, and it's, it's pretty exciting. What, what are the most important things that have happened that you think have, have brought you such, such success? Well, a lot of, to me, is, is the people you're, you're around. And, and, I started, and I started noticing that in high school, and, and I started getting older. When I went directly to the workforce and going to school in the evening, my, my group of friends changed. And you know, I wasn't no longer just going out in the, in the evening after work and, you know, and going and having fun. The conversations that were being had were different, were more about life and even back when I was working at the plant. And when I started working for, for, uh, for neighbors, my group of friends changed. And that's when I started realizing that if, if I'm looking at my group of friends, if I'm looking around and I don't see them or where I want to be in, in, the, in the five years or in their lifetime, I'm not around the right people. And I wanted people to motivate me because I think that a lot of people take for granted how great it is to be an American. A lot of people take for granted how great this country is that enables someone like me, someone that didn't speak English, someone that was here on a permanent, on a, on a visa, to be able to be a first generation, you know, um, Mexican American and change the scope of our life. And that's why I, whenever I speak to, to young kids and I tell them, I say, hey, you have a head start. You could do a whole lot more than anything that I can accomplish because all it takes is one person. Like for me, for example, no one in my family had graduated from college. Now my, my sister graduated from college. My nieces are going to OU or they're going to, um, to Baylor. One's going to UTEP. And they're talking about that when they're 10, 12 years old, and now that uh, once she's turned 18 and she's headed to, uh, to Norman, um, they're talking about that whenever they're 14, 15 years old. I didn't have those discussions growing up. I didn't have those discussions growing up because I didn't know any better. And to hear them talk and say, well, I want to go here and I don't want to go here, it, it, it's, it's heartwarming to me because I see that the decision that my mom and dad took was the right one. And, and so it, to me, it's, it's, it's incredible. But I just I wish that people don't lose sight of how great America is because I'm very fortunate to be able to travel the world and do business in other parts of the country. And it's very difficult to go do work in Saudi Arabia. It's very difficult to do work in Colombia, in Argentina, in Mexico. It's very difficult. In the U.S. is more, it's, it's, it's friendly. You, so the United States provides the, the great opportunity for anyone that's willing to apply themselves and, and make the most of it, and it's, and it's just such a blessing. But I've always had a lot of good friends that, that have motivated me. Your work ethic, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't teach that. You, know, that's, you have to have it, you have to want it. If you're an entrepreneur and you're seeking motivation, you need to try to do something else. <laughs> you know, because like you, you just, there's no, there's no other thing to motivate you. Uh, entrepreneurship's difficult. It's not for everybody. And, and it's, it's uh, it's fun because it, it, it challenges you, and, but everything that challenges you, you know, makes you better because you're going to learn, you know, you're going to learn what, what, you, what you don't know and what you're good at and it exposes every, every aspect of, of, of you as a person, as a leader, as a manager, as, as everything. Advice you would give people, young people? The best advice I would tell someone is you determine your ceiling. Don't let anyone else tell you what you can and can accomplish. And regardless of wherever you are, we all have obstacles. For me, growing up, not speaking English, that was an obstacle. I would be made fun of because I didn't speak English. But I, I used that as a motivation. I used that as motivation for me and say, why would you make fun of someone that's learning to speak two languages when you just speak one? I said, I don't get it. So. There's, al there's always going to be other people that are going to, you know, may tell you you can't accomplish something and you can't do something. The only one that can tell you yes or no is yourself. Because if you're willing to work hard for it, 
you'll be able to achieve whatever you want. And it's, it's difficult though. And don't get discouraged. That's the, that's the, that's the thing is, um, you know, people, they embark in a journey and trying to start a business or try to do something or a health goal or, or whatever, and they get discouraged. But I, I tell people, it's, like I don't, I don't fall in love with the end goal of anything. I fall in love with the process of doing something. Because that's something that when you fall in love with the process, something you're going to repeat day after day after day. Because if you, if, let's say you want to drop 10 pounds for the summer. Or you're going to do everything you can to get to that. But once that goal is achieved, that desire is no longer there. Fall in love with the process. Don't fall in love with the end goal. Because they, once you get there, you're like, okay I, I, okay, I did it. Okay, that's it. But when you fall in love with the process, it's just things that you incorporate on your daily life. You're going to get up in the morning, brush your teeth. You're going to work out, you're going to eat, eat healthy or limit whatever you're doing, but fall in love with that process that will get you to that goal. Not, not just, don't make it, don't make it so goal oriented. Goal oriented is great to give you the vision, but the process is going to keep you there. You know, that's, that's the most, to me, that's the most important. Tonight's art is a sculpture entitled Hope by the artist Mate Carranza. She is a Spanish artist, writer, and educator, mainly writing in Catalan. She was born in Barcelona and completed studies in anthropology in 1980 and then taught secondary school for the next 10 years. Carranza published her first novel in 1986. It was awarded a prize for children's and juvenile literature. Her bestseller, Trilogy of Witches, has been translated into more than 20 languages. In 1999, she wrote her first novel for adults which also was her first work in Spanish. In 2011, she won the Spanish National Prize for Children's and Juvenile Literature for her novel, Poisoned Words. This sculpture can be seen at the Office of the Arts Council of Midland. Finally, thank you for joining us for One Question. We will be back each Saturday at 4.30, where we will get answers to the questions you want to know from the people who know. Other ways to watch One Question include Basin PBS Facebook, Passport, and YouTube. If you have a question, send it to us at onequestion at basinpbs.org. I'm Becky Ferguson. Good night.